have one remaining with the individual, and he's not going to let her leave the aircraft at this time. He made me feel very sure that uh, we had a very real and horrifying threat. We don't know who he was, where he came from, or where he went. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the D.B. Cooper Sleuth. I am the host, Ryan Burns, and today I figured we could talk about some of the stuff he carried. Uh, as a hijacker, he was not particularly overburdened uh, with things. He famously had a briefcase, uh, and a lot of people now know that he had a paper bag with him, uh, contents unknown, which we can discuss later on. But really, what we're dealing with here is a guy who didn't need much, or at least didn't appear to need much. So the first things first, we can start out with the note he had. We know he carried onto the plane uh, a handwritten note that he gave to Florence Schaffner. Now, this handwritten note was uh, on a blank, on an unlined piece of paper, according to Florence, about six by nine piece of paper. And it was folded over and it was put into an envelope, just a blank envelope. Now, he handed this to Florence Schaffner um, as uh, near the end of her rounds after she had served her drinks, essentially as they were about to make their way to the, uh, to the runway to take off. They were actually taxiing at this moment. And Florence was about to go sit down in her jump seat, which was directly behind Cooper. So Cooper hands her this note, and famously, she immediately puts it into her purse and doesn't read it. Well, several times, Cooper goes back and looks at her. He keeps turning around and looking at her, kind of talking with his, with his eyes a little bit. It's kind of the way she uh, explained it, um, that he's, he's looking at her directly saying, hey, you know, look at the note. So finally she does, and she opens it, and of course it says, Miss, I have a bomb in my briefcase, and I want you to sit by me. Now, there is some controversy, not controversy, but there's some discussion about what the note actually said. Now, in her testimony, Tina says that the bomb said, Miss, I am hijacking this plane. I have a bomb. Sit next to me. Florence, in her testimony, says, Miss, I am hijacking this plane. I have a bomb. Sit next to me. And I am inclined to believe that it actually said, Miss, I am hijacking this plane. I have a bomb sitting next to me. Now, the reason I think that is because when Florence Schaffner went to the cockpit, they gave her uh, some things to do. I'm not sure if Florence was handling the situation well. Um, I, you know, She admitted that she was a bit freaked out by everything. She immediately thought of her brothers and sisters not having her around uh, about death and things like this, about the bomb. So the, the co cockpit crew kind of didn't want to let her go back to the rear uh, in the state that she was in, because clearly that would have upset the passengers and it would have alerted the passengers that something was going on. So they gave her some tasks to do. They gave her some notes. They said, here, take some notes. They gave her a little legal pad sort of thing. And they said, take some notes about what's going on. And on one of these notes, it says in her handwriting, Miss, I have a bomb in my briefcase and I want you to sit by me. Well, what my line of thinking is, is that, remember, she carried these notes to the cockpit and she had them up there for a little while. So my guess is she was probably looking directly at the note as she wrote that note, as she wrote her own note. So essentially it was a, a transcription. And interestingly enough, uh, the way that Florence describes it is she says that the miss, this is what she tells the FBI later on, she says miss was in uh, all caps, essentially. They didn't have the term all caps back then because they weren't texting or anything, or anything like that. But um, it just said, um, I forget what the exact phrase was, but it may, basically it was all capital letters, miss. Then we believe that the rest of it was probably in, in neat legible cursive, which is a uh, miss, I have a bomb in my briefcase and I want you to sit by me. That's probably what the note said. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Florence, when she went to write down his ransom demands, she just wrote these down on the envelope because there was nothing left, you know, you know it didn't matter anymore that, that she could write on this envelope. So in fact, she tossed the note, well, it's kind of confusing, but it seems like that, that Florence may have dropped the note to her feet, either in shock or to let Tina see it, because Tina, Tina would have been sitting right next to her uh, in the, uh, in the other jump seat. Um, it's interesting that Tina just never noticed this interaction between uh, this passenger, keep looking back at, at the girl next to her. Um, but I guess she was busy doing some kind of pre-flight checklist or something, I don't know. Um, but at any rate, Cooper says, take this down. And Florence pulls a pin out of her purse 
and she writes down on the envelope uh, Cooper's demands, the $200,000 for parachutes by five o'clock, you know, yada, 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 all that sort of stuff. So what Florence does is she goes to the cockpit with these notes and eventually Tina comes and, and grabs these notes, uh, 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 these notes back from Florence. So we know that obviously he had um, an envelope with him. Okay. Now, of course, here's the, here's the whole kitten, kitten caboodle, as they would say, is the briefcase. Well, he definitely had this briefcase with him. So the briefcase was described as cheap looking by Tina. Um, some people called it brown, others called it black. Alice said it was about 12 inches by 18 inches. So really just a standard briefcase. Um, would have been nice if we had a little more detail on the briefcase, but there's just, there's just nothing in there. Okay, now inside the briefcase, uh, Cooper had what he claimed to be dynamite. It was eight sticks, uh, four on top of the other, uh, taped together with red tape. Now, so four on top, four on bottom. And um, these sticks, dynamite sticks, whatever you want to call them, uh, were about six inches in length, which is important to remember because we can discuss that later on about why that is important to remember. Okay. Now, this bundle of dynamite sticks had a battery attached to it, which uh, Tina said was about as thick as her arm. And if you go back and look uh, of the era of 1971, Basically, um, we're talking about a, a, a D cell battery, a, a, D, a number six dry cell battery. Okay. Now, from this bundle was a red wire, uh, which Cooper held in his hands at all times. Um, Cooper explained um, to Flo and presumably to Tina that all he had to do was touch the wire to a contact and um, we'd all be dead, is what he told um, Florence. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, Tina, Tina's father was an electrician. So Tina was able to essentially um, describe what she was seeing and know what she was seeing. Tina even described that the that the end of the uh, of the red wire had been stripped. So Cooper had stripped the red wire to expose um, well, the wire underneath, you know, the copper wire underneath. So if this bomb was not real, it was certainly a, a convincing fake. I can tell you because having researched um, other hijackers of that era, they were never as as thorough um, and, and as detailed in that. Um, some of them had shoe boxes and just said there's a bomb in here. Um, some of them had very obvious road flares. Uh, some of them just claimed to have a bomb and didn't have anything. Um, really, it, it wasn't necessary to even have a display of a bomb um, because nobody was going to question that because the, the consequences of, uh, of bravado or um, calling a hijacker's bluff could have been catastrophic. And so they never did that. And interestingly enough, if you read through the FBI files, the FBI themselves, they never question whether this bomb is real or not. Um, it's just, it's a moot point, essentially, because what does it matter? Um, they, ha they have to assume it's real. So very rarely, um, a few times you'll see an FBI agent say, well, maybe it was flares. But generally, they investigated dynamite thefts, um, dynamite purchases. They, they assumed that it was real. And really, if you think about it, uh, one thing to think, one thing to consider is uh, it's it's common to say that this, that these were road flares because um, that would make sense that you know road flares can look like dynamite they can fool people um, but road flares are long road flares are about 15 inches long they have to be long otherwise you know the flare is going to burn your hand burn your arm now dynamite is usually about I believe about six to eight inches long which is essentially how long Tina said it was how, how long Tina said these were. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Tina said that they looked like large firecrackers, which is always a um, an interesting uh, thing to see that the, that she called them firecrackers. And she also said that they were the they were the cut that the uh, the dynamite was the color of her uniform, which Northwest Orient wore a bright red. And some have speculated that well, that some people have said well, real dynamite's not red. You know, real dynamite is um, an off red color. But that's simply not true. You can Google dynamite sticks, and there's plenty of them that are. Um, red. Um, very few are fire engine red, but plenty are red. Now, um, this does kind of lend credence that maybe this is a, a Looney Tunes uh, type briefcase uh, bomb. It, you know, it looks just like something you'd see out of a movie, but, you know, maybe the things that you see out of a movie are um, Dane or, you know, come from reality. Okay. Because this is, this is how you would do it. And um, in fact, uh, a, a gentleman named Georger, who is a D.B. Cooper sleuth himself, 
actually contacted some uh, some Marine friends of his who did demolitions and had them rig up an actual, I guess, an IED um, that was to the specifications as Tina described how this was working, where the wires were going into, where the wires were coming out of. Uh, and they actually detonated it. It did go off. And in fact, um, last year in, in Portland, uh, Vancouver, actually, um, we were having a discussion at CooperCon at dinner about about the about what what it would take to to pop blasting caps on dynamite. What kind of you know would this battery have set it off? And one of the people at the table we were with had a brother who was a pyrotechnics expert in Hollywood, and called him up at the table and said, "Hey, uh, you know how many uh, volts or amps? I'm not an electrician, forgive me, but how many you know volts or amps are, are required to, uh, to 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 pop a blasting cap for dynamite?" And essentially, uh, it was enough. Uh, whatever this, uh, whatever number six dry cell battery had in it, would have been enough juice to have to have set that off it, if it had been real. But obviously, we simply don't know if it was real or not. I don't. The only advantage to it being real would be that it would be a method of suicide for Cooper if he wanted to go that route. But really, there was no reason for it to be real. Um, it wasn't necessary, but it was certainly a convincing, uh, a convincing fake. Um, one concept I have thought about was that if, for example, if Cooper was cornered and you now he had told Tina, he did say, uh, I will not be taken off alive or uh, something of that sort, um, you know, that um, I'm not leaving here, that, you know, I'm not going to prison, essentially, um, so that he was probably would have killed himself. You know, as, as, what, as what he told her, at least. Um, but the, the, my, one thought I had was that if this was a guy with a family, uh, perhaps if he wanted to blow himself up, there would be no remains left. Um, consider, and this is fact, I've actually seen these, um, there was a, a hijacking, Australia's first hijacking occurred in 72. I don't wanna say it was it, it, that it was exactly a Cooper copycat hijacking, but the man did request parachutes, he did request money. Um, it wasn't a plane that he could have jumped out of, it was a, a smaller plane. Uh, and he was killed uh, by you know, local police eventually in Australia. But he had no identification on him, and it was a real mystery about who this guy was. And so they put his paper on, or they put his, the photograph of his dead body even on the news uh, in newspapers. You can go online to Australian newspapers and see this see this dead hijacker. Um, you know, do you know this man? And it took them about six months uh, to actually figure out who this guy was. I believe he was from Tasmania or somewhere like that. Um, but he was from one of the islands around there. But they did find out who he was, but. Perhaps Cooper didn't want his, if, if the FBI were going to storm and, and gun him down and he had no identification on him, perhaps Cooper didn't want his dead face on the cover of the New York Times or the, the, the Vancouver Columbian or the Seattle Times, right? Maybe if, if he blows himself up, well, there's no body to do that for. And of course, this is a time before DNA, right? So he'd be able to, uh, uh, you know, not have his, his dead body on, on, on the newspapers and bring shame possibly to his family, right? Um, now. What happened to the briefcase? Um, some would say that he he jumped with it, but I I don't subscribe to that. I know that from the other copycat hijackers, uh, and you'll hear me bring up the copycats a lot. Now, obviously, they are copycats. They're not the guy, right? There's only one Beatles, right? You know, there's only one originator of a concept, really. So Cooper kind of gets bonus points above the copycats, but the copycats are human. Cooper was a human. Humans generally do what humans do. Right. Okay. So what they all did with their stuff when they were ready to jump is they just tossed it. Now Heinemann actually left his on the plane, left his briefcase quote bomb on the plane, and the um, flight crew eventually threw it out over the Pacific Ocean or over the uh, Atlant over the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they jettisoned it out the back of the plane. I'm sure the FBI was really thrilled that that they did that, but they did that. But at any rate, uh, McNally chunked his his briefcase stuff. Um, McCoy chunked his stuff. Lapointe chunk some of his stuff out the back. Um, although he didn't, although the bomb, LaPointe left his fake bomb on the plane, which is kind of, but his fake bomb was really a pretty cheesy fake bomb. It was, a, it was, a, it was the genuine road flares. It was pretty tacky looking. Um, but anyway, so, but the FBI believes that Cooper just chunked his out the back. Uh, in fact, that was the basis for when they contacted, uh, or when the SR-71 was attempted um, to, to fly over the flight path looking for this. They were looking for the briefcase and they were looking for uh, the dummy chute, which 
Cooper had no way to attach this famous dummy chute to his harness, so it's unlikely that he did anything with it. Um, he may have done something with it, I don't know, but the FBI, at least for their part, believed that he chunked out at some point you know, between Tacoma and the Lewis River area, wherever he jumped, uh, that Cooper chunked, just simply chunked out his briefcase uh, and simply just chunked out the dummy chute as well. So the SR-71 was actually uh, implemented to try to fly over and, and look for the briefcase uh, and look for the dummy chute over the flight path. But uh, all five times that they flew the missions, uh, that was cloud cover, so typical of the Pacific Northwest in that time of year. So they weren't able to, to find anything, okay? But the FBI definitely you know, believes that, that he chunked that. So we've got the note that he had. We had the briefcase that he had. We have the, the, the faux bomb, a real bomb, whatever you have it. Uh, then we get to, you know, perhaps the most mysterious item he had was this bag. He had this, um, this, type, of, uh, this type of bag. Uh, Tina called it a plastic green shopping bag about the size that you put a dress shirt in from like a mall. Uh, Nancy House, who was a witness, uh, saw Cooper carrying it. And um, she said it was about a few inches smaller than the briefcase um, and about as tall as the briefcase, too. So about, you know, four inches tall and, you know, that long, whatever, but long as a brief, you know, short, slightly longer, slightly less long than the briefcase, but a little about the same height as, as depth as a briefcase, kind of. Um, so now what was in this mystery bag is complete speculation. Uh, it's, it's, I don't even have well-informed conjecture to offer, really. Um, certainly, we can look at the copycats. Uh, they all had similar mystery bags, I suppose. Um, and all of them actually carried, carried pistols. Several of them in their mystery bags actually had a pistol. McNally had a pistol in his. LaPointe had a pistol. Um, so they were carrying firearms. And so it's I could speculate that Cooper had a firearm because what if somebody called his bluff on the bomb? He could say, well, I still have a pistol, right? So I, I do think that because every single copycat that I've ever encountered, LaPointe, Heineman, Heady, um, Melvin Fisher, McCoy, McNally, they all had pistols with them. So I, I speculate that Cooper had one too. Now, what was in this bag? Again, we don't know, but um, the copycats had rope. Some of them had rope. Um, some of them had food. Um, tape, um, gloves, goggles, things like that. So whatever was in Cooper's mystery bag was not something that he used uh, in the actual hijacking. It's not anything that he was seen using. So um, really, we have to speculate that it was whatever was in that bag would have only been used for his jump or his escape once he got on the ground. So perhaps a flashlight, canteen, um, you know, I don't know. Certainly, certainly, I do think the pistol. Um, I've actually asked McNally, it's, it's a great resource to have Martin McNally still alive, still around. I actually uh, asked him about flashlight. Would you have had a flashlight? And he said, no, he would not have wanted a flashlight. He'd have been too tempted to use it. And using a flashlight in the woods, especially if there's a manhunt going on or if you're trying to lay low, not really the best way to do it. But I would certainly want a pistol if I was him. Um, boots. Now, again, you know, we talk about Cooper jumping with these no type uh, you know, you know, no, no lace up shoes uh, or no tie type shoes is the way that Tina described them. But maybe he had um, some boots in there. We don't know. Um, paratrooper boots, you know, they can fold over the, the, the top is pliable leather. You can fold them up. I actually did. I actually did an experiment, um, you know, with with I found one of these. Uh, I found a bag about the right dimensions, as, as was described. And I was able to fit gloves and goggles and a, and a you know, canteen, a pistol and boots in there as well. So I do think that, you know, he could have had all kinds of things in there, perhaps some sort of a transmitter or a walkie talkie. You know, I think that a walkie talkie would have been a smart thing to do if um, because he could have, you know, gotten to the ground and turned it on and listened for law enforcement to see if they were actually tracking him. He could have jumped on a police frequency somehow. Uh, there were pilots who thought maybe he had a um, some sort of a, a transmitter um, that could give him directions about where he was or, or let him know. Uh, when he was flying over certain uh, spots. Okay. Now, what's interesting to note about this, about this paper, about this, I call it paper bag, plastic bag, about the bag, is that only three people ever saw it. That's Tina, Nancy House, who saw him as, she, as Cooper was leaving the bathroom. Uh, he was carrying it on top of his, on top of his briefcase. 
And then Bill. Interestingly enough, uh, Bill uh, Mitchell, uh, the college kid who sat across from Cooper, last year at CooperCon, I was talking about how Bill saw this bag and I, I could see Bill going, oh, no, no, I, I don't you know, remember that, you know, and he came up to me afterwards. He was like, I don't remember anything about a bag. I said, well, your actual, your, your testimony in your original testimony to the FBI, you said that he had a bag and a briefcase. So, you know, Bill had forgotten that, but he, he did spot the bag. Now, this bag is, was not spotted by Florence Schaffner, which tells me that Cooper was not carrying the bag as he approached her. So Cooper saw, or sorry, uh, Florence uh, observed Cooper walk across the tarmac to board the aft stairs, okay? Now, she, all she said in her testimony was that she saw him walking across wearing black and he had a briefcase. Didn't say he was carrying a, a bag with him in the other hand. So, and uh, how Williams, you know, you know, you know this does not comment on that, just says he had a briefcase. So part of my speculation, I've begun to have a theory that perhaps the bag was inside the briefcase originally. Now consider this, um, when Tina describes the briefcase bomb, she says that the bomb was in the left corner uh, of, the, of the briefcase or in, in the left corner of the briefcase, which if, if, if it's in the left corner, that means it doesn't fill the whole briefcase. That means there's still room in the briefcase for you know, just dead space. Now, imagine if you're Cooper and you're walking through the airport with a briefcase in your hand. Um, what if you just have a dynamite thing in the, what if you just have your, the bomb, uh, real or not, just in this briefcase? It, it would be you know, sloshing around, perhaps. If it's not the same, if, it's, if it doesn't fill the briefcase up and it wasn't taped to the briefcase, which there's no indication that it was, um, but, it, but, but it was small enough to be in just one corner of it, uh, then perhaps uh, Cooper whatever was in the whatever was in the bag um it did have some bulk to it according to nancy house so perhaps it was stuffed inside um the briefcase the bag was inside the briefcase and kind of acted as stuffing in a way to keep the bomb from shifting around and uh, at some point once cooper sat down in the plane he opens the briefcase up uh, you know slyly and, and removes the bag from the briefcase and perhaps i would speculate put the bag under his seat now, the reason I say under his seat is because, again, Florence never saw it. Um, Alice never saw it, even though Alice came over and talked to him. She never saw it. Florence never saw it. Saw it and none of the passengers saw it except for, uh, except for Nancy House, who saw him leaving the bathroom with it, and Bill. Well, how did Bill see it? My speculation is that Bill, who was sitting right across from Cooper uh, with an unobstructed view of Cooper, uh, saw it under Bill's seat. Okay, That's what I think, is that he saw the bag underneath Bill's seat. You know, but because it was underneath his seat, that's why Florence and Alice didn't see it and no other passengers really observed it. Um, so that's my thought about, you know, the bag. OK. So what else did he have um, besides this bag, the briefcase, the notes? Well, he had his Raleigh cigarettes. OK, he, he smoked Raleigh cigarettes, uh, filter tipped uh, out of a soft pack, apparently. And uh, he smoked uh, several of these cigarettes. Um, not sure if he was a chain smoker, but he would have smoked about eight of them. Uh, people say he only smoked about eight or so within, you know, during five hours. That doesn't sound like a lot. The hijacking takes place over five hours um, and he only smokes eight cigarettes or so. Um, but really, that's not true. I don't think it's true because, you know, there's no indication that Cooper smoked after the plane landed in Seattle. So really, if you just look at the two and a half hours or so when, they're, when they are uh, in the air from Portland before they land in Seattle, um, He's smoking about a cigarette every 15 minutes or so, which, you know, that, that's puffing along. Not That's not bad. All right. So he's got his Raleigh cigarettes. All right. Now, he also had, he also had two matchbooks. Um, he did not use a lighter. Uh, he, was a, he used matches. You know, people, people did have lighters back then, but he was, a, he, was a, he was a match guy, apparently. And the two matchbooks that he had um, were uh, Sky Chef, uh, which was a, a restaurant. And there was one actually in inside the, the PDX airport. Uh, there was a Sky Chef restaurant inside there. Um, but these were just matches that you'd pick up at the restaurant. Um, so some have used that to speculate that perhaps uh, Cooper um, had flown in that day from somewhere. Perhaps he started his day elsewhere. Um, that's not, you know, that, that, that did happen. Um, for example, McCoy flew from, uh, flew from uh, Utah to Denver, to the airport, got off the plane in Denver, and then got another plane, and that's the plane he hijacked. Uh, unfortunately for him, 
It was the same crew and the same aircraft that he had flown from Utah to, uh, to, to Denver with. So his prints were all in the plane, even though he wore gloves during his hijacking, his prints were already in the plane because it was the plane that he had flown earlier that day on. Okay. So that'd be like if DB Cooper, if DB Cooper, you know, had had Tina and Flo and all of them on an, you know, on an earlier flight that day, it'd be kind of awkward. Right. So, but that's, um, that was that. So we had the Sky Chef matches, which could, which could be indicative that he flew in that day or could be indicative he was a frequent flyer. Um, but he had gone through a several of them. That was the pack that he had run out of. He, he ran out of Sky Chef matches. So um, we can surmise that he at least had had those matches for a while. Um, I'm not sure how many cigarettes he smoked earlier that day, but he, he did run out of Sky Chef. Okay, so he had smoked enough cigarettes with that pack. So perhaps this would have been something he had had earlier. Um, or maybe just something he found in the airport. Who knows? Okay. Now, Tina, uh, apparently, according to uh, Bill Ratajkowski, um, in her debrief with the FBI, and this is not actually in the FBI files, although it is in um, Richard Tussauds' book, and Bill Ratajkowski has mentioned it, um, that, uh, that Tina had these, uh, these matches, or that, that Cooper had matches um, for um, what we would think would be the uh, be the International Correspondence School, which was like a you know University of Phoenix sort of thing, um, of course, well, it's a correspondence school. And now these matches were really ubiquitous; they were all over the place. Um, these ICS matches that was one of their main ways of advertising. Okay, so Cooper had this ICS matchbook, but again, that does not tell us anything, perhaps, um, but because of how ubiquitous they were, they were everywhere. Okay, they were they were the AOL CD-ROMs of their time for, um, for any of you who are, I guess, old enough to remember that. Okay, so he had this ICS matchbook, and here's a clip actually of uh, Bill Ratajkowski talking about that. And I said, well, you know, in the debriefing, what was on the matches? Well, it said, how to get a high school diploma. Remember that match? That <laughs> okay, so he had the match. He had the matches. He had the cigarettes. Um, something else that he may have had that we there's no reason to think he didn't have was Benzedrine. Okay. Benzedrine was essentially the, the Adderall of its time. It was an amphetamine. It was used for um, housewives uh, who were trying to lose weight, sort of. It was used for an antidepressant. Uh, truck drivers would abuse it. It would essentially just pretend it's Adderall. Really, that's all you have to know is that Cooper had, Adder Cooper had Adderall with him. Now, whether it was prescription or, or not, you know, I don't know. I, actually, I believe somebody recently said that um, it had become a controlled substance maybe in 1969 or 1970. So it may have actually been illegal by the time that Cooper had it. Um, but it was just essentially an Adderall type product. And we only get this though from, um, well, it's in Richard Tussauds' book, but it's also Bill Ratajkowski uh, tells a reporter about a week after the hijacking um, that Cooper had Benzedrine and offered it uh, to the crew and said, hey, do y'all want some? Um, you know, I know you've been up all day, you know, essentially, and here's some. Now they rejected it, of course. But I don't have any reason to doubt that. Um, you know, uh, McNally had amphetamine type substance with him. Um, Billy Hurst, who was a, a Cooper copycat, had similar stuff. Um, Heineman, the copycat, had Benzedrine with him. Um, exactly, he had Benzedrine with him, the exact product. So this was not uncommon. Again, just, just picture Adderall. You know, and you'll get the point. Now, another thing he had with him was a pocket knife. Um, apparently a pretty sharp pocket knife because he was able to cut through um, a, a lot of things with it. But um, Tina says that at some point, this pocket knife just emerges from his pockets and he uses it. Um, and the FBI are pretty impressed with his uh, pocket knife skills. In fact, he was able to cut uh, about 90 feet of shroud lines and then make then tie um, that sort of stuff with it. Okay, he tied the bag with the, with, with the, um, with the, with the paracord that he had cut with his pocket knife. So he definitely had a pocket knife with him. And other items he had with him, well, he, we know that he at least had two $20 bills when he got to the airport because he paid his fare with a $20 bill. And then once he gets on the plane and he orders a drink from Florence Shafter, he pays with a $20 bill. Now the drink was only a dollar. Um, so Florence says, hey, look, I, I don't have enough change. You're the, you're, you know, she was, he was the first because he was sitting in the very back. Uh, he was the very first uh, passenger that she served on the drink service on the flight. Okay, so she did not have enough change. So she says, can I come back to you later on with the change? He says, that's sure. And of course, famously, Cooper spills this drink. Uh, so the one drink he actually orders, he actually spills it. Now, 
Uh, it must not have made too much of a mess. So uh, perhaps it was just the ice that was left. Uh, but Bill Mitchell is the one who reports that Cooper spilled the drink. Uh, we don't hear that from anybody else, but Bill says that that was the first time they noticed this geeky old guy, he called, as he called him, was when, uh, was when he looks over and sees uh, that he had spilled his drink. So perhaps it was just ice left. Maybe he had downed it really quickly, and, and that's why um, that's why his bourbon seven up, um, you know, didn't cause too much of a mess. Okay, but um, so so I always like to joke that Cooper was inconveniencing Florence Shafter even before he hijacked her. He was that customer who made her go get the change and things like that. So these are the things that. That, that Cooper carried. It, it's really not much. You know, his, his briefcase, his mystery bag, some cigarettes, pocket knife. Now, he did have a large top coat with him. And inside that top coat, very clearly could have had a pistol in there, could have had gloves, goggles. It's, it's really important to remember that, yes, uh, Cooper almost certainly jumped wearing a suit, okay? Because the last time Tina saw him, he was had already done all the... He already, had, he already had the parachute strapped up. He already had, um, you know, the, the paracord tied around him, all that sort of stuff. So, I, but it, I do think it's possible that you know he could have put boots on if he had boots with him. Perhaps I don't know if the bag was big enough for that. But you know, Nancy, the way Nancy House's description, it could have been big enough. Uh, the FBI speculated that the bag. There, we have uh, in the FBI files. They speculate that could have had a flight suit in there or a jumpsuit, which we, we don't think he obviously he didn't have that. But they also speculated he could have boots. In there. So the FBI themselves said he may have boots and he could have put those on, you know, after he had sent Tina to the cockpit. Um, um, but, you know, we had this image of Cooper, um, you know, jumping with his suit on and just jumping, you know, but probably looking at the other copycats, he probably had goggles on, probably put gloves on. We don't know. Cooper was back in the back of the plane for 30 whole minutes, essentially, um, before he jumped um, alone. So we don't know what his appearance is, that his exact appearance was when he jumped. He very easily could have had goggles, you know, soft cap helmet. I mean, you know, who knows what he had on. Um, but he, you know, it seems like he would have planned to have something. But again, whatever was in the bag was something that was that had to be used for his parachute jump or uh, during his escape. So that's that. So, but yeah, so a pretty economical hijacker. Uh, didn't need much. Uh, probably almost in a way that almost um, kind of denotes the kind of guy he was, I would say. Um, just a very kind of a sparse guy. He was winging it, folks. I, it's kind of a hill that I'm going to die on is that Cooper was winging his drop zone. And there was no way that he had any idea where he really was. He may have known what county he was in just by dead reckoning and by being able to look out and see the lights of uh, Portland and Vancouver coming up in the distance. He probably knew, where he, probably knew roughly where he was. But for him to know with any specificity where he was jumping to, really, really difficult. Uh, Cooper never even specified a speed for the plane to go. Um, now, you could say that obviously the configurations that he set them up with um, would have you know, necessitated them going a certain below a certain speed with the gear down, flaps down. They don't want to destroy the aircraft by going too fast. So he kind of put a restrictor plate on how fast they could go. But, you know, when you're flying three miles a minute, four miles a minute, you know, how fast you go, how slow you go, these things really matter with where if you're trying to drop to a jump to a specific point. And also, listen, he had uh, triple cloud cover beneath him, uh, basically all the way until um, from Seattle to Eugene, Oregon, they said uh, they had triple cloud cover beneath them. They could not see um, beneath them. OK, so Cooper um, was really winging his jump. He, you know, e even if he had configured them to fly down B-23, if he was you know, knew they were going to pick Victor 23 Airway, you know, they could have, I mean, Victor 23 Airway, I believe, was eight or 10 miles wide at that time. And they had clearance to be anywhere within there. Now, they flew as close as they could to the center line because they're going to, just like you're, you know, tr if you're, you know, driving down the road with a, with a, you know, uh, you know, driving down the road with a, what they call it, a donut on your car, right? Uh, you're going to, you know, I mean, you're not going to be bobbing and weaving with the, with the, with the, with the, with the small donut tire on your car. You're going to be being pretty careful. And if you listen to Bill Radichek talk about it, he says they were, you know, basically, you know, 10 to 2 on the on, on the yoke there, okay? They, they were definitely uh, staying straight, okay, down Victor 23. But again, Cooper didn't know that, so they could have been anywhere. So I, I think that Cooper was dead reckoning where he was. I think that he probably had an idea of where he was. Now, whether he wanted to jump there, I don't know, but he, regardless, he jumped there. Um, so I, I, I think that 
him having him having sparse equipment on the plane with him compared to other people um, is kind of indicative of the kind of guy he was. He was kind of a guy who could just wing it. Um, now, whether that was just him or whether he was suicidal and didn't care or whether he was aloof and just didn't think about certain things, because it does seem like he was smart in some ways and um, kind of aloof in the other ways. Um, I often think about him not demanding his knapsack. Um, you know, he, I think it's likely that his knapsack would have been worn front face, front forwards. If it had, if he had, if his knapsack had showed up with the money, I think he would have put it on backwards. Like you wear a backpack backwards. Then he simply would have strapped his parachute on over, over the back, over that backpack. And it would have stayed on him kind of like a, a baby, a papoose uh, or whatever, kind of a front sack, a belly bag, as the paratroopers would say. Um, but instead of saying, Hey, where's my knapsack? He, uh, MacGyver's this for about an hour and a half. Um, MacGyver's this, this money bag thing, which is, was just dubious. I, I would have just said, Hey, wh- wh- you know, where's my, uh, you know, where's my money? Wh- you know, go get me a knapsack, go grab one off some kid in the airport. I don't care. I want my knapsack. So it's interesting that he didn't demand that. Uh, instead, he just devoted all this time to just focusing on this task. I don't, it's very, I don't know. It's psychologically, that's a strange thing for him to do. And people can say, well, he didn't want, you know, to introduce new elements. He maybe he didn't, uh, you know, do the knapsack thing. Maybe he didn't demand the knapsack because he didn't want, you know, it was more, uh, more, I guess, uh, error points or, or, or fail points, I suppose. Um, you know, perhaps they could have put trackers in the, in the, in the bag, or they could have done something with the bag, but I don't know. I mean, Cooper demanded, demanded crew meals and things. He was still demanding things after the, after this happened. So he could have, I mean, I don't see why he wouldn't have, wouldn't couldn't have demanded that the knapsack and he complains about it too. He actually threatened to blow the plane up. If you listen to Bill Ratajczyk, Bill says that, that, um, Cooper actually threatened to blow the plane up because he was so mad about not getting a knapsack. But again, you're so mad about your knapsack. Well, just ask for one. You know, that's what always been kind of strange to me. But anyway, I think I think that Cooper was just kind of an interesting guy. But that's all a, a, a sidebar to what I really wish wanted to talk about today was the things that he carried uh, wasn't much. So uh, future episodes, I'll talk about his appearance. I'll talk about uh, what he was wearing, his clothing, uh, things of that sort. But uh, today, uh, that's the episode today. And so I hope you enjoy it and uh, subscribe and, and like uh, and I will see you guys soon.